Brother Robert's sermon text is Romans chapter 9, verse 21. Um, his title is, Hath Not the Potter Power Over the Clay? 921 says, Hath not the potter power over the clay? In the same lump, to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. Uh, the first thought that came to my mind when I read that text was Jacob and Esau. They were in the womb together. They spent nine months inseparable. Um, but when they were born, one was made honorable and one was dishonorable. Um, when you think of them <clears throat> um, and you think of when uh, God's people are referred to, they're referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not Esau, Jacob. So this is a, a, a good example of the Lord showing us that he is sovereign. And that's what Brother Robert's going to come and speak about, is the so how God is sovereign. Amen. Good afternoon, brethren. Very thankful to the Lord for um, Brother James's message. This, these questions, you know, I, as I've um, been thinking about Paul now for the last few months, um, in more detail, more focused look at the Apostle Paul and how God gave him a unique ability to be able to, to reason with the people of God. And he employed questions a lot. He was a master question asker. He, he knew what to ask a person that would draw out of them what was necessary for them to believe. Well, that's a, this, obviously, the Holy Spirit's involved in this. See, it's, it's as you come to God and as you, as you reason with him, now, see, he can change your heart. Yeah. He can change your heart. You start thinking about your sin. And he can change your heart. He can change the way you think about sin, in other words, to where, oh, you don't want to do that anymore. Only God can do that. But see, Paul was a master builder. So he knew what, what, what to talk about, what to think about. And um, he provoked people. Now, this question, actually, it, it, there's, a, there's a lot of questions in chapter 9. And I want to look at these questions in chapter 9 because right, they all, like, build on one another and, and they... They're, they, they kind of like hinge on one another. The way this line of reasoning goes, hath not the potter power? No, that's he really, you don't, I think a young person would be able to answer this correctly. I, I think so. I, I think on a, at least on a rudimentary level, just a, a beginner's level. I mean, they've all played with Play-Doh. They know they can make whatever they want to with their lump of Play-Doh. You know, you don't need to go to Bible college for six years to be able to answer this question. You don't. I mean, you, you, see, this is something that God's made in, in such a way that you can get your hands on it. You can understand this question. You can answer it correctly. And the bottom line, what, what, what I want to focus on, out of, draw out of this question, is that God is over all. Or above all. Yeah. He is. It isn't, there's, God has never asked man to judge him. Ever. God's never asked man's opinion. What do you think? Yeah. Man does have an opinion. But see, when it, when it comes to matters where God has sh shrouded what he's done and has given us no explanation for what he's done, it is wrong for man to try to to, to try to dig it up, try to figure it out. God hasn't revealed it. Yeah. So as we look at this, God, do, we'll find that God does prefer some nations above other nations. He does. I mean, it, it, it's foolish to, to, to think otherwise when God's given us such a demonstration in the scriptures. If a person knows the scriptures, they'll know God has preferences. God has a purpose. He has a will. He has desires. Blessed is the man that knows them and, and aligns himself with the desires of God. Amen. 
Throughout this, uh, Paul is going to point out that God is so specific in who he chooses. He, it's even down to individuals. God can choose an individual above another individual. Not only can he, he has over and over again. God has demonstrated that his right to choose is really the supreme right to choose. God has and does chosen not only nations, but people and, and, um, and specific people. He said, well, he chose the nation of Israel. But then out of the nation of Israel, you know, Esau was of Jacob, right? He was of Jacob, but, I mean, of, of Isaac. He was of Isaac. You see what I'm saying? He, he was a descendant from Abraham just like Jacob was. Esau was a descendant, but he wasn't the descendant. Paul starts chapter 9 with a holy comparison and it would do well, the church would do well to re-examine the, 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 the comparisons that Paul makes in the beginning of chapter 9. 9 verse 1 is what he says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. Now, no one needs to read this now and ever think that Paul's making something up here. Paul started right off, as, I'm, not, I'm telling you the truth. Perk up. Listen to this. Yeah. Yeah. I say the truth. He's an apostle. He was taught by the Lamb of God. And he's getting ready to, to show us something that is absolutely critical for us to understand the election. No one's going to understand it until they understand what God did in Israel. Yeah. Yeah. God did something in Israel, unique. Mm -hmm. It's what he says. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost has testified to me that what I'm teaching is right. Yeah. That's what Paul's saying. Well, he's got a testimony from heaven, a divine testimony. What Paul's going to teach us now is right. This is the right way to think about God. Amen. Yeah. Tell us. I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren's sake, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Think of his heart going out to the nation of Israel. He knew what God had done in Israel. He knew that they were a chosen people, an elect people. And he also knew that the gifts and the calling of the Lord are without repentance. Well, see, Paul wasn't wasting his time ministering to his kinsmen. Eventually, this testimony is going to be exactly the thing that God uses to bring the nation to himself. This is, Paul wasn't wasting his time. He says, who are Israelites? All right, now some people say, well, it's a big deal. They're Jews. What's the difference? What difference does that make that they're Jews? Well, he's going to tell us. It makes a big difference. It makes a big difference who you are in your connection with God. See, it makes a big difference now. Paul's going to list eight things that proved that God had chosen the seed of Abraham above all the people of the earth. Now, you know, I've noticed people who have a problem with election, predestination, uh, people who have a problem with that are usually the ones that are on the outside. Usually. Now, the, there are some that appear to be on the inside, but the fact that they have a problem with what God's doing, it's very suspicious to me. Yeah. When a person judges God and implies that what he did isn't righteous, well, I'm not going to make the judgment, but there's going to be a judgment made someday. Right. We don't want to be on the wrong side of God. Right. Now, the King James Version uses this word pertaineth. I wanted to say a word about that because other versions, they use the word belong. That's good. See, the, these things that he's going to list, these eight things, they belonged to Israel. Why did they belong to Israel? Because God gave them to Israel. He didn't give it to any other nation on the face of the earth, but he gave it to Israel. These things belong to them. Some person says, whose is? Who did these things belong to? They belonged to Israel. You couldn't have them unless you were an Israelite. I know they had proselytes, but they had to become an Israelite. That's a point. They had to become part of the covenant. Or they, they were on the outside. 
See, all these things, these are, these are things for us to understand what God's doing in Christ now. Amen. God isn't, didn't do this just as an, as an appendage. That we wouldn't understand what God's doing in Christ had he not shown us with this nation called Israel. Who are Israelites? Now, number one, it says, to whom pertaineth the adoption. God never adopted another people. To this day, he's never adopted another fleshly people. He adopted Israel. So it says, um, God's talking to Pharaoh, or talking to Moses about Pharaoh, and this is what he says. Exodus 4.22. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. In other words, God's saying to Pharaoh, you're messing with the wrong people here. You're messing with my people, and believe me, their God was much more powerful than Egypt's God. Of course, they found out, didn't they? They found out. They messed with him. They messed with God's people, and God judged their gods. They didn't, they didn't fend too well either. He says, and I say, and you let my son go. You better let my son go. That he may serve me, and if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Yeah. And what did he do? He slew, he slew the firstborn of Egypt. Why? Because they wouldn't let his son go. They were adopted. <laughs> you see the parallels in Christ? You've been made one with Christ. The world thinks they can abuse you, but not for long. You think God's looking at this? And just letting it go. No, no, no. Yeah, They're building up wrath against the day of judgment. Right. People ought, they ought to be afraid to walk around and hurt the people of God. They ought to be. Yeah. You belong to God. Well, that, that kind of sobers you up, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of sobered me up. See, you want to treat the, to God, the God's people better than any other people. Any other people. Why? Because they're God's. That's why. They belong to God. Well, number two. To whom pertaineth the glory? The glory. Oh, I tell you, this was, it made me excited. I started getting excited. Amen. The glory. God gave it to Israel. All right? What is it? It's referring to the Ark of the Covenant. It's actually referring to God's presence with the people. God was with them. Now it was on a, it was, it was not like it is now in Christ, but it was much more than any other nation had. That's right. Much more than any. The, the Shekinah glory came down and they knew that God was in the house. <laughs> Praise God for that. Amen. You can know when God's in your house. You can know it when the Spirit's moving. Amen. Say, well, it's time to do some house cleaning. The Holy Spirit's here. Amen. See, you got the glory. The glory's with you. In Christ, the glory's with you. Take advantage of the glory. No other nation had the presence of God like Israel. No other nation. They, they saw it at one time. Remember, they stole the ark. <laughs> they sure wish they wouldn't have done that. Didn't take them long to bring it back. Why? Because that glory was for Israel. It was for Israel. People trying to sabotage the gospel. It's not working out well, out well for them either. Churches are closing right and left. Why? Because they tried to hijack the gospel and make money off of it, and you can't do it. Amen. Amen. It's for the people of God. Leave it alone. Mm. Yeah. Number three, to whom pertaineth the covenant? Oh, this is good. God gave, made a covenant. He made an agreement with these people. You don't never read about any agreement that God made with a Gentile nation. God didn't go over to Greece and say, I want to make a strike up a deal with you too. No, no, no. It was Israel. And it was based on the faith of Abraham. The promises that God made to Abraham. He, he, he blessed. He said, I'll make you the father of many nations. I'll bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. This was an agreement that God made. He blessed Abraham. And he made it a covenant with the nation of Israel. You had to be an Israelite if you wanted to get some of the blessings that were imparted by the covenant, the agreement. 
You had to be in, it, you, you know, there was a lot of blessings that went along with that, that covenant. Of course, you had to keep the covenant to get the blessings. But, um, you know, as, as bad as people want to harp on how bad is, as bad as they, they did have the covenant, right? They did. So the, the advantage was close to them. Now, we, we all know that he put it in place so that we would understand more about we can't really, we can't work righteousness in ourselves. How would we know that if it hadn't been for the covenant? Think of all the hard things that the nation of Israel had to go through so we would understand that we need Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They went through all these hard things so we would have a better understanding. I praise God for the nation of Israel. Amen. Amen. To whom? Number five. No, number four. I want to skip number four. To whom pertaineth the giving of the law. Think about that. Think about no other nation had a law that was holy and just and good. They may have had some ordinance or some laws, you know, don't steal from people. And that wasn't like God's law. It wasn't like God's, God's law was special. God's law was holy, just, and good. And technically, it's still in a force today because God wrote it on your heart. That's, not, that's the law he wrote on your heart. That's the same one. And now, now it says, thou shalt love the Lord with all your heart. And you say, I want to love the Lord with all my heart. Why? Because he wrote it on your heart. He didn't do away with that. It was good. They, he gave it to Israel. That's the point. I'm pointing out that God made the nation of Israel special. And he did it for a special reason. You know, if you were an Israelite back in those times, what could you boast in besides God? They didn't have anything else besides God. Their whole life revolved around God and serving God. Number five says, to whom pertaineth the service of God. Think about ministering in the tabernacle. What a thing. Remember it says, God's, it says there'll be a kingdom of priests. They'll serve me night and day. Did this? You, see, you can see the, the, the analogies there, the, the, the types and shadows. Now in Christ, we are a kingdom of priests. There, there really, there isn't anything that we can lawfully do outside of Christ. Everything we do is a service unto our king. Amen. Which is a good thing because in the end, then everything we do, there'll be rewards. When you I say, I, I, I got him off the floor now, we'll mop it for Christ and there'll be a reward. It goes down to that level. You can do all things heartily as under the Lord. Why? Because you, you're a priest unto God. Well, it pertains to the service of God. Now, I already said this. Their whole lives were bound up in worship. Their daily life revolved around doing all the things that God had commanded. I mean, it was, their whole life was filled up with this. Why? Because... God gave them things pertaining to his service. See, he gave them the tabernacle, the worship that surrounded the tabernacle. Why? Because it was going to teach us there is a certain approach to God that has got to be maintained. You can't just come to God any way you want to. But how would you know it had that they not lived this out in the tabernacle and temple worship? To whom pertaineth the promises? Now, now I have a particular love for the promises of God. You start to crack the book of the Revelation, the first three chapters, and it'll just warm your heart. These promises, these promises. Now you have to overcome. You have to overcome if you're going to be a partaker of the promises, right? Yeah. To him that overcometh, and then there's a great promise. Why does he do that? Because these promises are for you, for his church. Yeah. Or those are in Christ, you see. But how would you understand had he not laid this out in the nation of Israel? Number seven is who's are the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had people, real living people, that had had encounters with God, and that encounter had changed their life, and they had that testimony. They were a descendant of Abraham. Remember, now the Pharisees, they misused this. They said, we have Abraham as our father. And, and what did Jesus say? He said, if Abraham was your father, you do the works of Abraham. So see, it wasn't, he's saying here, in, in the context of chapter 9, he's saying it's not just the direct descendants. It's the one that has the, the faith of Abraham. That's the one that's going to, it's a promise. See, that's the one that gets the promises. I, I was thinking about this. You know, it's, it's almost like the Israelites are hardwired to the blessings. 
through Abraham? Did they have a direct link, a bloodline link? Now Christ comes along and he says your link to him is faith. See, that's even a a harder line. Mm -hmm. Faith, by faith. You read chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, by faith. Everything was done by faith. Why? Because it was so that the promise could be sure that all the seed, anybody who could believe, you can be included in this blessing. Number eight, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. Now remember Jesus told the, uh, the woman that came to him, he said, it's not right. It's not right that I give these good things to you. It, it, and and um, I, it, the, the scripture escaped me right now. But he, told, he said, and then remember he said, but she said the dogs get the scraps that fall from the table. It, it, was, it had to be preached to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Why? Because these promises, the covenant was with the nation of Israel. Now, Paul makes this, he makes this point, and I've taken time to go over this just a few minutes, because I don't know that it's possible to really understand the sovereignty of God without understanding what he did in the nation of Israel. You see what he did? He, he picked out a nation. He took one nation. First, he just took Abram. He took one man, picked him out, sent him out, and he built a nation based on what Abraham did. He chose Isaac over Ishmael, and then he chose Jacob over Esau. You see, you see this, 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 God's teaching us something, that he has, he has a specific purpose, and he has a specific way of bringing about this purpose. Uh-huh. Now, we, there's one thing that's, that's, that's absent from all these things. As I looked at chapter 9, there's one thing that you will never find in chapter 9. And that's why he did it. It's not in there. God never explains to men why he decided to do it in this manner. Yeah. It's not there. Why? Because this is God. <laughs> this is God doing his will. This is In an economy of faith... God doesn't have to explain all the particulars out. God says, I did this. And what his faith said, I believe it. Amen. And I'm going to rely on this. Why? Because God is holy and just and good. God can't do anything that's wrong. Amen. So, and see, all this is needful to know when you come to verse 21. God's over all. Remember when Rebecca... Wait, when I, I, we've heard a lot of bad talk about Rebecca and Jacob. There's been a lot of bad talk about what Jacob did to poor little Esau. Now, when you get in chapter 9, though, it, 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 you, you'll never get this kind of, kind of way of thinking in the Scripture. But I've heard a lot of people talk bad about Jacob. Oh, that liar, that deceiver. Well, this is what it says. Verse 10 and 12, when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. For the children not being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God of, according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. Now, now, remember now, Rebecca's walking by faith. Rebecca has faith. She's been told by God that the, the elder's going to serve the younger. And so she sets out to do what she can to do this. Isaac conceived, Isaac conceived both Jacob and Esau, yet we have a word from God now that God's going to have a preference for one and he's going to have a hatred for another one. Now, if God were a man, well, now, see, we may be able to be suspicious of, of his, of his uh, reasonings if God was a man. If I, if I told you I hate this one and I love this other, you may think, well, that may not be just because men can be unjust, right? Mm-hmm. Men can do things just solely on their, for themselves and not think of the consequences. We're talking about God now, and it's very dangerous to impute unrighteousness to God. Yeah, that's right. 
Very, so he says here, Romans 9, 13, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now, my point in bringing this up is, is that, have, have you ever heard anybody quote that verse and then right afterwards say something like, yeah, but we know that wasn't the best thing, or, or just imply, well, you know, that, that maybe that wasn't the best way to do it. Or, or how about if they just change the language to make it softer and say, well, no, hate really doesn't mean hate in the original. What it means is love less. Yeah, there you go. So Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I loved less. My rebuttal is whatever you do, you don't want God to love you less. Because you know what he did to Esau? He laid his land waste. He became a curse. Why? Because God hated him. Now, see, when, you, when you, you think thoughts like this and you think, what do I do with this verse? You just believe it. You just believe that God loved Jacob. Amen. And he hated Esau. And now, faith will tell you in the end, it'll all be, you'll, you'll see all the reasons. We don't need all the reasons. Faith doesn't need all the reasons, but it does need to believe what God said. When you look into what God's done and how he's accomplished it, what's your reaction? Well, do you judge God? You say, well, no one would. No, God forbid we would never judge God. What shall we say then? Why does he ask questions like this? Why is it, what shall we say then? Because he, a person could think wrong about this. A person could think about God like he's a man and it would cause suspicion. Yeah. Why would God act like this? Why would God love Jacob? He, I mean, lo love Jacob before he's even born. Why would he do it and hate Esau before they're even born? Before they did anything? Maybe he's trying to get us to understand that he can do whatever he wants to do. Yeah. Could it be that? Could be, yeah. That God decided to show something about himself. Yeah. And he chose to do it with these two men. Yeah. Jacob and Esau. How about Moses and Pharaoh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about that? Maybe God could use these two people and he could show us something else. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. You can't make God have mercy on you. That's, right. That's what he's saying. Yeah. I'll have mercy on who I have mercy. You, you say, well, I'll get in a certain posture and then God's going to have mercy on me. Really? How's that, how you guys that going for you? I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, what's, what's the conclusion of that? It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. So the real mercy is seen in the fact that God has saved anybody. Yeah. See, the lump that he's talking about is a defiled lump from the very beginning. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not any righteous. There's none that does righteous. So what God got to work with? He's got a lump that's defiled right from the beginning. So what are you going to do, God? Well, I'm going to make some of these from this defiled lump. I'm going to make them holy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now that's a work. Yeah. That's a work there. See, by, by default... If he had just left them alone, there would have been no righteous ones. There would have been no holy ones. We were descendants from Adam. I got a bad family tree, let me tell you right now. Bad, 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 bad. I got the kind of family tree that causes, the, it, it alters the way I think. So God is not picking out the good ones because there aren't any good ones to pick out. That's right. they're, they're not there. They don't exist. You see people's family tree, and, and over here it's like, it's almost like the ink is written with, you know, invisible ink. We don't want, well, there's somebody that lived during that time, but we don't want you to know about it. Because these were bad people. God only had bad people to work with. That's right. <laughs> but God can take that and he can make something that's holy. Why? Because he's God. He's holy and he's just and he's righteous. And he, he can change people, transform them. 
Fallen man really doesn't have the capacity to pull himself up by his own bootstraps. You know, I know, you know, we got this like thinking in America, this, if you just work hard enough, if you just push hard enough, you can get it done. When it comes to salvation, you can push and you can work as hard as you want. You can't get it done. And that's what God's teaching us in the nation of Israel. They pushed hard. Generations tried hard. They couldn't get it done. Why? Because righteousness couldn't come from keeping law. It couldn't. It couldn't. But how would you know that? They lived during hard times. And I praise God that they did. Because now, see, we can, we can capitalize on that. We can look at that and say, see, I don't want to fall into a, 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 a system of a law. Because I tell you right now, it didn't work out good for them, and it's not going to work out good for us either. God has mercy on whomever he will have mercy. Now, that's a great blessing if you can see it. Amen. That's a great blessing. So, so is Christ working in you? Do you have any evidence at all that Christ is working in you? What is that God's showing mercy? He's showing mercy. You've obtained mercy. All right, so what do you do? You don't, you don't take that for granted. That's what you don't do. You don't just sit back and say, well, he's saving me. I'll let him save me. No, no. See, it, you give all diligence in making your calling and election sure. That's, right. That's what you do. When you notice, when you notice, when God, see, the very fact that you noticed meant that God, like, opened the portal. It opened something that showed you something. Why? Because now you're going to be judged on the reaction from that showing. Yeah. He opened your understanding. You saw clearly, it's not by works of righteousness that I've done, but it's by his grace. All right, now, what do you do with that? Do you alter? Do you take your life and see things alter it? No, I'm going to turn away from this. What was that? God showed mercy. He opened up mercy to you. The apostle, when he writes like this, when he talks about Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh, I, I don't know if Pharaoh gets a bad enough rap. I really don't. Pharaoh was a hard man. A hard man. Yeah. All right, now in chapter 9, it's going to tell you why he was a hard man. People say, well, that was just his disposition. Why was that just his disposition? For well, the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Now you know what? God's going to get glory no matter what. No matter how men react, no matter how, if they ignore him or if they don't, God's going to get glory. Amen. Now in Pharaoh's case, it's like he pulled back the curtain and showed you the behind the scenes working of how God gets glory. Now God determined, he determined to get glory from Pharaoh. But it wasn't good for Pharaoh. Unless of course you like drowning in the Red Sea. And then he, why did he harden Pharaoh? So he could show his wrath. This is what it says. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of that at all. Right. You, see, God shows you mercy, all right? And so you, you're a vessel of mercy. Mm -hmm. I'm not ashamed of that. God's been merciful to me, and I'll testify to it. But he can also have vessels of wrath that he's fitting to destruction. This is God. This is not a man. Amen. Pharaoh was appointed. That's what it, that, what, it was appointed to what? To this end. That God was going to get him much glory on Pharaoh. Therefore, he hath obtained, he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he hardeneth. Now, is that hard to understand? Just those words. I mean, if that's all you said, just take a 10 year old. I'm going to have mercy on this bunch over here. Okay? This bunch over here, I'm not going to, I'm going to harden them. That's simple, isn't it? But see, when you start dealing with men's souls, then you start saying, wait a minute. No, God couldn't be like that. Why? Because you've created God in your own image. 
You have a God that's created in your own image. And you couldn't think of doing something like that. But then again, you couldn't think any, a, a universe into existence either, could you? You couldn't say, let there be light and there be light, right? See, you, you're not God. He's God. And so he's showing, he's demonstrating who he is. And it takes more than mercy to show who he is. Because God's more than mercy. So see, God's demonstrating something here. And, and see, what I brought away from this, this lesson is, I want to be on the side of mercy. I don't ever want to be on the side of his wrath. Because it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. God's not playing games. This is not a game to God. He's demonstrating who he is. So Paul anticipates, I believe it's, um, he's being led by the Holy Spirit to anticipate the response of flesh to this whole thing that I've been talking about. How is flesh going to handle this? That's what he says. Thou wilt say then, talking to the flesh, thou wilt say then, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? I mean, come on. If God made a garbage can, can he then judge it because people throw trash in it? Have you ever heard that? I've heard that. He can. That wouldn't be righteous. They just judged God. They just judged God now. They have to stand before God now and give an answer to God why they misrepresented him. Because this isn't what God said, is it? Well, the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose. God had a purpose there. See, that's what he's saying. I'll have mercy on some and I'll harden the other ones. And you say, well, then who's resisted as well? He's just doing what, he's, what he made you. This is his reply now. Want to hear the Holy Spirit's reply? Nay, but old man, who art thou that repliest against God? Who do you think you are? Yeah. You're not God. You don't understand what I'm doing. You don't understand anything about eternity at all. It's outside of your understanding. Right. You can't know. But then how do you presume to judge God? Yeah, right. yeah. But Paul knows. See, Paul's anticipating. The Holy Spirit's led him to anticipate. This is what they're going to think. This, uh, I'm going to share there with them something that's high and lofty. You know, God didn't have to write chapter 9, but I praise him that he did. Yeah. How would you understand what was going on? God opens the window, shows you a little bit behind the curtain. This is what I'm doing. And, but he knows flesh is not going to like this. Who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing form say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Will those who cannot understand even the smallest of the deepest mysteries of the natural creation around them contend with the one who created all things? Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. You've got people who say, oh, I'm an atheist. Well, that's a short-term plan. That's what that is. That's a short-term plan. Because that is not going to last very long. You're going to see him face to face. You're going to, because you're going to be in a prostate form of seeing him with your head bowed down and someone's foot on your neck. Yeah. And you're going to have to hear someone say, God was in me of a truth. Why? God's not a liar. Amen. God's not a liar. God's not a man that he should lie. God doesn't have to lie. Men have to lie to make themselves look better. God doesn't have to lie. Will those formed from the dust of the earth mount a rebellion against the one who breathed life into them? Is this possible? No. Well, just let's go to the Tower of Babel. You'll see. They wanted to make a tower to the. Well, they wanted to do the same thing Lucifer did. Yeah. God said no. No. Hath not the potter power over the clay? Would you deny the potter power over the clay? People, you know, they love this. Oh, I have my rights. We've heard a little bit about this. I have my rights. I can do whatever I want to. Well, you know, there's a sense in which God's right now allowing men to do what they will. Choose this day. He's allowing. But this is an allowance. You don't have a right. 
Yeah, I mean, you're not like born with a right to speak against God. Hmm. Hath not the potter power? Now, you know, j just in the analogy, you, you research it, go to Isaiah and Jeremiah, and he talks a lot about this potter. But he had power. See, he could do his will. He took the, the, the clay and he turned it into something that he desired to make. Would you deny him that power? No. But see, every time, every time we don't submit to the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit leads and you feel led and you feel like, I should do this. And you say, well, you know, I got, I got to do these other things, Lord. You don't understand, right? You've denied the potter. Because he, he, the potter's at work. Sometimes I think I've missed a blessing because I've just been so busy. I've just been so busy. I just didn't have time to submit to the potter. Hath not the potter power? He does have power. But right now, see, he hasn't made it overt power yet. But it's coming. There's a time coming when that potter, oh, we're going to meet him face to face. And, and I, I want it to be a good reunion. Yeah. A good reunion to where we can say, this is our God. We waited for you. Yes. We waited for you. Everyone laughed. We didn't care. We did it anyway. Right. Yes. Showed up anyway. We denied ungodliness and worldly lust. It wasn't easy, Lord. You know you were with us. But you gave us the strength to, to do it. To do it. Yeah. Yes. Hath not the potter power over the clay. We, you know, it's his clay. This is his world. Yeah. And, and, and if, 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 if he can create the clay, then you know, you know he's got the power to make something out of it. <laughs> I'm thankful to the Lord for being merciful. He's, he's, if we're, not, we're talking about a, power, a potter that has mercy. Yeah. <laughs> he makes vessels unto honor and vessels unto dishonor. He says, of the same lump... And I love that too, you know, because you can find your association there either way. It's of the same lump. We came from the same lump. Yeah. That's right. It's like, well, those out there, they're, you're of the same lump. Sorry to have to inform you of that, but you're of the same lump. Right. You have nothing, nothing of your own. You, there's nothing that God looked down from heaven and said, oh, now that lump. Well, look at that one. That is a much better lump than this one over here. No, it's the same lump. Same. And it's, it's, it's right that it's done that way because he was going to make it an economy of faith. Yeah. See, that we have nothing to boast in of yourself. You're going to have to trust that Jesus has done all things that you couldn't do under the law of Moses to be righteous before God. So it's of the same lump. We have nothing to boast in. There's a commonality among all things created. The fact that you were created means you're of the same lump. You had no power. God had to breathe in you the breath of life. Mm. You know, there's many babies that are born that never breathe the breath of life. They die before they get that. You didn't. You're here today. God gave you the breath of life. Amen. Amen. Now, in the age to come, perhaps maybe he'll send you over to some nether region to instruct those that never breathe there, that never walked by faith, that never knew of God's grace the way you know of it right now. See, you're, gonna, you're, you're ambassadors for Christ now. Then you're going to be kings and priests. <laughs> I tell you, you're going to reign with Christ yeah. forevermore. What? He's getting you ready. This is school. This is eternity school right now. Yeah. You're, being, yeah. you're being tutored for great things to come. Yeah. Right now, you have a commonality. Right now, we all came from the same lump. We all are operating by the same faith, the faith of Abraham. We get blessings, showers of blessings, abundant blessings, but they're all from the same God, the same Christ ruling at his right hand. We have commonalities, my point, see? It isn't like God looked down and said, oh, Robert, oh, I had to come because Robert's, that's, it. that's not it at all. But see, Satan wants you to think that that's what it is. You're special. You're that special one. Well, you know, in Christ, you can have an identity that's special. That's true. But it's not you, it's him. Amen. That's what makes you special. Amen. There's a very real sense in which the lump can never be more than the lump. <laughs> you take Christ out of the picture, we're just the lump. Yeah. That's, that's all, you know, how, can you really boast in that? 
I'm, I'm just a lump. That is until the master takes it up in his hands and he puts it on that wheel and he starts making something. Now you find uniqueness. Now you find your calling, your election, your calling. The thing that God once done in you all of a sudden starts taking form. Now, see, we're workers together with God in this. See, we're workers together. God's doing something, but he's employing you in doing it. Now, that's a gracious God. That's a, yeah, he could just say, be this, and you'd be that. But he wouldn't get the glory. He's going to get the way he's done it. You see, in Israel, he, 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 he strove with them for years and years, millennia of time. Why? Because he wanted us to know he's a merciful, he's a gracious God. He's got patience. You think, well, I just don't have that kind of patience. Well, you stick with Christ and he'll develop it in you. You'll, have, you'll be able to have patience with people. Maybe last year you didn't have that much patience. But do you stay, stick with Christ? He'll work it in you. He's working in you both to will and do of his own good pleasure. He's conforming and transforming. And in the end, he doesn't recall you a lump anymore. See, you've graduated. In the end, when you die and you're present with the Lord, you're together with him, no more will you be referred to as a lump. See, that, that's, it's, them days are over. God. We all started out as unprofitable vessels, lumps, if you will. And had not God stooped down and humbled himself in Project Salvation, we would all remain a cancerous lump, unworthy of of any good, none, rotting in our own blood as it were, useless and repulsive, but the master works with purpose and precision. He knows before he ever starts working what he's going to make. This is something we don't know. See, it's not, we look, in, look in the mirror and you can say, I don't know what you're going to be. It doth not yet appear. Mm -hmm. But see, to God it does. God doesn't work aimlessly. He works with precision. He knows exactly where you're going to fit into eternity. So he starts making the vessel to fit in that slot. Mm -hmm. The clay is the perfect medium. Do you ever think about that? See, how's God going to have sons, many sons in glory? Well, he had to start somewhere. And this lump, this is the perfect medium. He takes the clay and he forms it into that thing. In and of itself, it's not eternal even. It's, it's temporal. And yet, when he's done, it'll be eternal Amen. in the heavens. Now, that's God. Only God could do that. He says, what if God, and, and this is the last question, and I'll close with this. What if God? Willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. There's a sense in which, and I know it's just a sense, the ultimate is not this, what I'm going to say, but there is a sense in which all of us were born unto destruction. Had, I'm saying if God had not intervened. Right. See, that this was, we weren't born good. I know you know this. But I just had to refresh my own mind in this. See, there is none righteous. And that really is what it means. So the lump was bad. But see, he had some vessels that, that he, he, he's talking about what God's doing here. He was going to fit some for destruction. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. Now, remember to start it out, what if God? Just what if God wanted to do this. What if he wanted to make some vessels under the dishonor, under destruction? And what if he wanted to make some vessels under honor? You see how God gracious he is? He's putting this out there for us to think about. Because when you start thinking about this with God, it'll build your confidence up. Amen. That he might make known the riches of his glory and the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even unto us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, 
Remember, he started out talking about the Jews, told you all the good things that he did for Jews, but they were exclusively for the Jews. It was just the Jews. Just the Israelites got it. But here he says, not only unto the Jew, but unto the Gentile. God's not constrained. He's not constrained or he's not subject by the foolish surmisings of the vessels of wrath. See, it doesn't make any difference how loud the, 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 the world rages against him. It doesn't matter. Yeah. See, we hear it. We hear people, they rage against God. God's in heaven. There's a sea of glass before him. This isn't like ups. God's not up there wringing his hands. I sure hope they make it. He's working all things together for our good. Amen. Those who would mount up an argument against election need to reconsider their faulty reasoning. They, they, they need, they need to, to stop and think it's dangerous to judge God. God said it like this, the way it's been presented. God said it. This is what he said. And it's left up to us to do one thing that's profitable, is just believe it. Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Why doth he yet find fault? Who hath resisted his will? Who art thou that repliest against God? Hath not the potter power over the clay? And I'll leave you with my final question. What shall we say to these things? Praise God for Jesus. Amen.